Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, yes, thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. My name is Jamie, um, and I am with Eastwind Books of Berkeley, which is an independent bookstore located in downtown Berkeley. Um, the bookstore has been around since 1982 as a community uh, cornerstone for Asian American and ethnic studies literature. And our mission is to promote and provide a platform for Asian American and Pacific Islander writers, poets, activists, artists, and community members um, to share their work. Um, so in addition to book selling, we also host a number of book talks and panels which leads us to today's programming, um, which is also co-sponsored by the UC Berkeley Japanese American Studies Advisory Committee. So today I am excited um, and honored to introduce Naomi Hirahara, who is an Edgar Award winning author of multiple traditional mystery series and noir short stories. Her Mas Arai uh, mysteries, which have been published in Japanese, Korean, and French, feature a Los Angeles gardener and Hiroshima survivor who solves crimes. The seventh and final Mas Arai um, mystery is Hiroshima Boy, who was nominated for an Edgar Award for Best Paperback Original. Her first historical mystery is Clark and Division, which follows a Japanese American family's move to Chicago in 1944, after being released from a California wartime detention center. Her second Leilani Santiago Hawaii mystery and internal lay is scheduled to be released in 2022 this year, stay tuned. Um, and we are joined by our wonderful host and friend of Eastwind Books, Andrew Wei Leung, who is an assistant professor of English at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on the literature of Japanese diasporas um, in the Americas. He is the translator of Lament in the Night, um, published by Kaya Press in 2012, a collection of two novellas written in 1920s Los Angeles by Nagahara Shosan. Uh, he is currently completing a book manuscript titled A Queer Queer Race Orientations for Early Japanese American Literature that examines the writings of Shosan Sutakichi, Hartman, um, Arishima Takeo, and Yone Noguchi. I hope I got those names right. I'm so, so sorry if I didn't. Um, so throughout the talk, um, if you have any questions for Naomi or Andrew, please drop them in the chat box. Below, we will have a Q&A after um, Naomi gives a presentation and um, engages in a conversation with Andrew. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Naomi. Hello, everybody. It's really wonderful. I, I see that there's um, some academics from Hawaii with us. And there's uh, Mary Doy, who is very instrumental in capturing the history of Chicago here. And my agent, Susie Cohen's here too. So um, we, we've got everyone, the whole gamut. I'm gonna start um, the program by reading a section, the beginning of Clark and Division, and then sharing some slides about the research as well as the writing and then and, uh, Professor Leong's gonna engage me in a conversation. So if you have some hard questions, here's your chance. You know, feed them to, to uh, Professor Leong and I, I may or may not answer them, we'll see. Um, I'm starting off with this slide because the beginning of the book starts in tropical. This is chapter one. Rose was always there, even while I was born, being born. It was a breech birth, the midwife soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mother's, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot good and hard. Ito-san, 
The midwife's voice cut through the chaos, and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran. Pop couldn't catch her at first, and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days, and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. Our first encounter became Ito family lore, how I came into the world in our town of Tropical, a name that hardly anyone in Los Angeles knows today. For a while, I couldn't remember a time when I was apart from Rose. We slept curled up like pill bugs on the same thin mattress. It was pachanko, flat as a pancake, but we didn't mind. Our spines were limber back then. We could have slept on a blanket over our dirt yard, which we did sometimes during those hot Southern California Indian summers, our puppy resty at our bare feet. Tropical was where my father and other Japanese men first came to till the rich alluvial soil for strawberry plants. They were the Issei, the first generation, the pioneers who were the progenitors of us, the Nisei. Pop had been fairly successful into the housing divisions came. The other Issei farmers fled south to Gardena or north to San Fernando Valley, but Pop stayed and got a job at one of the produce markets clustered in downtown Los Angeles, only a few miles away. Tonai sold every kind of vegetable and fruit imaginable. Pascal celery from Venice, iceberg lettuce from Santa Maria and Guadalupe, Larson strawberries from Gardena, and Hale's best cantaloupes from the Imperial Valley. My mother had immigrated from Kagoshima in 1919 when she was in her late teens to marry my father. The two families had known each other way back when, and while my mother wasn't officially a picture bride, she was mighty close. My father, who had received mom's photograph from his own mother, liked her face. Her strong and broad jaw, which suggested she might be able to survive the frontier of California. His hunch was right. In so many ways, she was even tougher than my father. When I was five, Pop was promoted to market manager, and we moved to a larger house, still in Tropical. The house was close to a red car electric streetcar station, so Pop didn't need to drive into work, but he usually traveled in his Model A anyway. He wasn't the type to wait around for a train. Rose and I still shared a room, but we had our own beds, although certain nights when the Santa Ana winds blew through our loose window frames, I would end up crawling in beside her. Aki, she'd crawl, cry out as my cold toes brushed against her calves. She turned and fell asleep while I trembled in her bed, fearful of the moving shadows of the sycamore trees, demented witches in the moonlight. So that is from the beginning. And that starts our PowerPoint here. Um, so Tropical is a neighborhood. If you know Los Angeles, it's near the intersection of Gar uh, Glendale and Los Angeles. And it's basically present day Atwater. And this drawing to the left is something, you're gonna see my drawings. I have to give you a warning here and there. But I, I did this um, slide just to explain a place. Like, why did I pick a place like Tropical? Well, like maybe two or three decades ago, I had interviewed a, a Nisei and he told me, we grew up in Tropical. And I was going, I've never heard that. And it was like this magical word that it, it was just filed away in my brain. And, um, and it just came out for this book. And um, I have a affinity to this place for a number of reasons, which I drew, drew here, including my husband had once taught and um, been a counselor at John Mar Marshall High School, which is a historic high school where Rose, my character Rose and, um, and Aki had lived. I guess I better tell you, some of you who don't know about the book, um, it's this is the, the the boiled down synopsis. It follows a family, the Ito family, from tropical to Manzanar, and then um, the older sister Rose um, goes first to Chicago, and then later um, the younger sister Aki, and and the book is told from her point of view and her parents 
uh, follow Rose to Chicago several months later, only to find out that something terrible has happened to Rose. So now it's, uh, and Aki, you know, she idolized her older sister. So now it was up to, it, it's up to Aki to find out the truth, as well as to carry her parents, her Issei parents to this traumatic period. So that's essentially the gist of the story. Okay, so why did I write about um, Chicago? Um, it's, uh, and, and um, photographs um, have been very helpful as well as ephemeral, like postcards and tickets and things like that. But this is a war relocation authority photo. And it's actually, most of the war re relocation authority photos sh show smiling people. So at least this one shows kind of differing emotions, um, concern, worry, um, astonishment about this. This is a family from Sacramento who had been in a uh, camp in Tule Lake, which is on the Northern side of California. And now they have arrived in Chicago and this was their reaction. So, um, uh, and, and this, this topic, um, the, the way I kind of got into Chicago was two reasons. One, um, I worked many years as a reporter and editor at the Rafu Shimpo newspaper, which is a newspaper, Japanese American daily in Los Angeles. And I would encounter so many either elders who had spent some time in Chicago or acquaintances that had been born in Chicago. So, but I never really put everything together until um, I worked on a nonfiction book with my Heather, Heather friend, Heather Lindquist uh, called um, Life After Manzanar. And then I learned like so many, that was the number one destination for Japanese Americans um, after being released from the 10 mass incarceration camps, the reasons there were 400 before World War II, after uh, in the mid 1940s, there were like 20,000. And so, um, yeah, so this was kind of a fascinating thing. And uh, later I'll share, you know, being a crime writer, what piece of information really um, drew me to pursue this. Here's another, and talking about images, um, um, here's one that was taken by European photographer, Marianne Palfi um, in New York City. And this was actually taken in Los Angeles in a hostel there in 1946. But I included it because her photography really affected me in terms of the tone of um, Clark and Division. Um, it's her, um, she just captured, especially uh, young people, children, their faces. And like, look at this young girl, you know, she looks, she, she looks like you don't want to <laughs> face her. She's like a tough cookie. And in the background, you could see Evergreen Hostel. This is another photo taken by Marion Palfi. And this one, I, I think this is the main photo that stayed in my mind when I was working on Clark and Division, just that the chaos of the room, it's kind of like us during the pandemic, you know, we have clothes strewn everywhere, they're hang there's no closet, so they're hanging their clothes, you know, on the wall, and the these three little girls, um, I think uh, Professor Leung saw this uh, photo before, and he was <laughs> captivated by the scary doll here. And there's a, a bowl on the floor. This is probably the Rafu Shimpo newspaper that's um, started to republish in 1946. I'm sure people were trying to look for work. So I kind of hang, you know, hung on to this because this is a, a, a story, the quote resettlement or the transition out of camp. That's really, I, I think there's a lot of interest now to tell the story, but up to now, we really haven't heard much. So this is where the crime writer um, comes out. One of the documents in my research that I came across was from the Chicago Resettlers Committee, and it, it was from the 1940s, and it was kind of bemoaning the juvenile delinquency that was occurring. I mean, it, it was not, 
um, totally widespread, but enough for them to take note. And they were concerned about babies being born out of wedlock. There was abortions, which were illegal at the time, and other crime, other and criminal activity that I actually just integrated in the book. Um, for Clark and the Division, I really, because there's not much, um, especially in fiction about this topic, I, I felt a responsibility to try to be a, a lean on actual true experiences as much as possible. And one thing that was super helpful, I, mer I mentioned Mary Doy, she was part of a team. It's all on the internet, these oral history in interviews that were, uh, it's called Regenerations that the Japanese American National Museum kind of oversaw. One thing um, that was difficult to find within Chicago were photos of these type of young men. They're from probably Boa Heights, East LA. They were um, wearing, you know, the zoot suits, the infamous, um, you know, baggy pants and the oversized jacket. Many times you have like a chain hanging down and, um, you know, a, a very, a, a suspect, you know, um, outfit by, um, in the eyes of um, establishment of these inner city youth. And so they brought their um, zoot suits with them when they went from camp to um, Chicago. And one of the, and these photos were from Janice Tanaka, a filmmaker. And she was telling me, of course, you know, so many people moved back to the West Coast. So you're really going to find a lot of these kind of photos of these uh, Chicago zoot suiters actually in Los Angeles in their photo album, albums. Oh, and another thing, for those who have read the book, there's a character named um, Hammer and he, Ishimine, and he was um, inspired by men like these. Now, how does a person like me, a Los Angelino, a Californian, I have, I, up to the, my interest in writing about this topic, I had only been in Chicago one time. Um, and it was to at a JCL convention. Although I, you know, I try to make the most of that trip, but still, like, how did I have the audacity to tackle this? And um, there were some friends that uh, social historians. There's oh, every community has people who really love their um, native history. And um, Eric Matsunaga, who had lived in Los Angeles, so that's where I met him. He was he's one of these people. If you're interested in the topic, he's written some nonfiction um, articles for a website called Discover Nikkei, which is under the Japanese American National Museum. And on Instagram, he's on Windy City Nikkei. So you can follow him there. But as you can see from this uh, Google map, he had um, plotted where, where all these different Japanese American businesses were in several different parts of Chicago. But this one was for Clark and Division, which is an intersection within Chicago. And it was an early way station, um, Clark and Division, as well as the south side um, of Chicago were the early locations for um, Japanese Americans being released from camp. Um, many uh, people, in this Clark and Division, they moved out and went into Lakeview side of Chicago. Um, they didn't stay here, but it was a very chaotic time. And one thing I decided that I, because I'm an outsider to the Chicago experience, I would write about a very um, limited and small neighborhood such as Clark and Division. And um, in the very early years, 1944, um, when where there's not that many documented, that much documented history, but this I'm standing in front of. Um, this is on LaSalle, the street of LaSalle, and this is the LaSalle Mansion, where at one time held a number of Japanese American um, families and, and individuals, and was it's a beautiful facade actually, but it was um, the model for the apartment where um, the Itos move into. Um, I will say there's not much left of it. And there's, 
there's not that many landmarks in Chicago of the Japanese American presence. You're not going to find, you know, a Jap Japan town like you do in other urban areas that had a lot of Japanese Americans. And one reason why was the government really discouraged Japanese Americans from gathering in numbers, in large numbers, you know, although they had to because they had no other place to live, but they, you know, but the message was, you know, don't build like a very um, noticeable building, you know, that um, celebrates your heritage. One building that um, is still in the Clark and Division neighborhood is this Mark Twain Hotel. And that's a postcard on the bottom. I love postcards because one thing is they're, they use color. <laughs> so you get a sense of what the color, you know, instead of just looking at a black and white um, photo. So, uh, and this is SRO housing, single residency, occupancy housing today. But what was really interesting was um, that they had this um, uh, beauty box, this beauty parlor that was inside of this building, which, you know, I also echoed it in my, in Clark and Division. Another funny thing was um, because I'm like this LA journalist reporter, I, you know, I just kind of walked right through the building and Eric's like following me because what are you doing? It's like, well, I want to see this place. So, I mean, it's sometimes being an outsider, you know, you, 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 we don't have the good manners. So we just kind of invade places, but it could be helpful sometimes. Um, there are some last vestiges of the Japanese American experience. There is this Nisei Lounge, which is a bar. Um, it's, they don't have Japanese American owners, but the owners do respect like the, the origins of this tavern. It, I think it started as a liquor store in the um, Clark and Division uh, neighborhood under a different name. And what we're eating here um, um, is, is, this is a dish called the Akutagawa after a, uh, a uh, Nisei named George Akutagawa, who I apparently went to an eatery, this famous hamburger king and said, you know, make something with bean sprouts and green um, peppers, you know, and ground beef and egg and mix, you know, it's kind of like this chow man kind of very down home. What's really important is gravy over rice, which was, there was a lot of this. What was fun was um, there's a Japanese American eatery in Little Tokyo here, and I did an outdoor event, and they kind of recre recreated some of these dishes that um, Japanese Americans ate like in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, perhaps. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, and here, oh, here's the regenerations. Uh, I, I mentioned um, the oral histories, and this is Kate Kawahara. That was the beautician who owned the Mark Twain beauty box. Um, and this location was very important to me personally, as well as for the uh, novel. This is the Newberry Library. Um, the woman to the right is Sue Kunitomi Embry. She was an educator and, and she was a friend and she was an activist and she fought for um, Manzanar to be a national historic site. And she came from Los Angeles, like Aki. She was in Manzanar. She was released first in Madison, Wisconsin, but eventually came to Chicago and got a job at the Newberry. And I was very um, ignorant. I thought, oh, you know, because when uh, Eric and I were walking, I just noticed the Newberry Library was on the map. And I said, oh, let's go there because Sue worked there. I thought it was like a, a small um, branch library. And to see this, it's a world renowned re reference library. And to see that and go in and just imagine Sue working in a place like this, you know, from like the dusty um, barracks of Manzanar, um, kind of blew my mind. And I thought, wow, what that must have been something else for um, Sue to experience. And also she had mentioned this was probably one of the first times she worked alongside people of other races, which made a, a positive impact on her. So I also um, wove that into Clark and Division as well. 
um, this, um, so this was my second, I took two research trips. This was my second trip in 2018. And another friend, Bob Kumaki, um, who's from the South side, he drove me. Now we, we're not walking, we're, we're driving. And he drove me to the Montrose Cemetery, um, which is also, which is also a very important place in the book. And this is one of, besides some of the temples, this, uh, this mausoleum, Japanese mausoleum, is one of the few places, at least that I saw in Chicago, that really marked, you know, this kind of piece of ethnic history. This mausoleum was created by the Mutual Aid Society before World War II, and it was a place like like poor bachelors or poor immigrants could have a resting place. And Mont the Montrose Cemetery was um, one of it was, I think, the only cemetery at certain times that would accept um, Japanese bodies, you know, to be buried, you know. So, um, so that was important for me to include as well. Um, when I went in 2018, I spoke at the Buddhist Temple of Chicago, which is Bob Kumaki's temple, and um, it, since it was a, a festival, they they didn't have everything out and. They, they kind of took me in the back and showed me, this is an altar, a carved altar um, from actually Heart Mountain concentration camp that, um, and the, uh, the, the priest had been from there and brought this beautiful altar with him. So, you know, behind closed doors, there's these vestiges of this very rich history. Um, Clanners was another place, if you read the book, which is a um, white owned um, funeral service um, mortuary that um, they handled the majority of the Japanese American um, uh, funerals. So, and that was in this general Clark and Division area, it was on North Clark. So, I wanted to include that in the book. And here is the his, this is um, way after the 1940s, but it's still the same building, the police building that I modeled, you know, I imagined um, Aki going into as she investigates what happened to her sister. And then I'm gonna quickly, this was um, because uh, Professor Leong apparently likes my <laughs> artwork. <laughs> um, I spoke to his class yesterday, so um, I wanted to briefly talk about just developing character and writing. And um, my editor, to be perfectly honest, took me to task about um, developing the voice of my protagonist, Aki. Um, I will, this is not an excuse, but you know, I wrote uh, the last maybe 60% of it during the pandemic and had to rewrite the whole thing dur um, during the pandemic as well. But what I like when I, I, I've done some writing workshops about writing character. And I, I say, you know, I love, I used to work at this historic hotel called the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. And I used to sell a lot of things, including cigars. And I just like the cigar box. I love you know, the very nostalgic feeling that you put your treasures in this cigar box. So these were certain things. Some things are not things you necessarily want to hang on to, but um, these like symbolize different things that I had to deal with in rewriting the book. So I'm just going to mention a couple things. One thing that I found that I that was an obstacle that I had to overcome was my own emotional and cultural blocks. Um, um, my editor said that I almost never let us into her psychology, Aki's psychology. And um, I was think I in, you know, this is a fictional book. My parents were not incarcerated. Although, you know, I'd spent all these years doing research and my extended family had been in camp. But I think the way I connect the most to Aki is probably because she is the child of an immigrant and um, is, a, is her parents' protector as well as interpreter. And I think when you're in that position, um, sometimes you don't even know how you feel yourself because you are busy trying to um, 
um, accommodate other people's feelings. So this was, and this is one example of little bits of narrative of, of, of writing that I had to weave into the narrative. And I looked down at my hands in my lap. I never considered saying how I felt about things. How could I, when I always seemed to be grasping in the darkness to understood where I to understand where I stood. And of course, with Aki, you know, being a minority in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, I mean, that is her challenge as well. Um, one thing, this is supposed to be our hourglass, and um, you know. And there are times I had to mind my own experience because um, my editor also said, give us a lot more insight into Aki's thoughts and feelings. Another thing that's interesting, I know if you take in a writing class, they usually say, you know, show, don't tell. But I think that's an easy way out. I mean, that's easy to say, but when you're, especially if you're writing um, first person, you do need to tell, you know, so it's a delicate balancing act. So, and this is a photo of me and my mother. We were, my mother is, is originally from Hiroshima and I was three years old and I was with her. So I just, you know, to, uh, included this photo for another PowerPoint presentation, but just like for me growing up in America in the 1960s, you know, being Japanese was, uh, not, it's not like how we, you know, Japan has lost a lot of soft power now. People love the food, people love the language, people love anime, but it wasn't that way when I was growing up. And so I would have to deal with prejudice and microaggressions. So this is a line uh, section from the book. By this time, we understood how the world worked for us to articulate the attitudes against us would give them power and credence. We prefer to release the pain silently, let it rise in invisible blooms that we couldn't see, but we could feel, bumping against our foreheads and shoulders, warning us not to stray too far from what was expected. So that's the end of my, my PowerPoint. Um, gosh, that was a bit long, wasn't it? <laughs> Um, but all, all wonderful, so no need to apologize. Please um, put some questions in, into the chat. I'll go ahead and ask uh, the first question, but try to reserve as much time for uh, audience questions. So the, the first question that I'd like to ask you is, uh, Clark and Division represents a, a tremendous shift in a lot of, of your previous, from a lot of your previous writing. So it's a first person narrator, um, female protagonist when seven of your books were an older male protagonist. Um, and you had faced a lot of writing challenges in this, like uh, to list a few, um, most procedural fiction starts with somebody who's really embedded within a city that knows it inside and out. And Aki learns the city of Chicago as we do as readers. And so doesn't start from a position of mastery or competence. And another element that I, I found so interesting and why I asked you to talk a little bit more about um, editorial feedback and, and disclosure was that it seems really kind of um, gendered the, the way that uh, an amateur sleuth who is a woman has to, has to disclose psychological state or emotional state in ways that noir male protagonists like Jack Nicholson in, in, in Chinatown is, is like the, the example here, can be perfectly emotionally buttoned down, don't have to disclose anything or you know, just, just be a body that moves through space. And what's going on with that shift of expectation about there needs to be psychological insight, emotional sensitivity, all those uh, dimensions in uh, your shift to first person and then historical fiction? Um, I think that one thing um, in reference to your second point, you know, I went to Stanford, <laughs> not, not Berkeley, which they're both great institutions, but one of my professors was um, Sylvia Yanagisako, and she, I took a class called Women in Cities, and it was just, um, very fascinating about, and I never had thought about it before taking the class, 
that women are just not allowed. I mean, it's this is a given, right? We're just not allowed in certain spaces. Um, and it, it could be in the Middle East. It, it could very be very extreme or it could be um, more nuanced, like um, someone like a Japanese American in Chicago, woman in Chicago. And I, I kind of even experienced that in Japan because um, I studied there for a year and I would just eat um, at the local, you know, they have these such, such quaint restaurants, right? The corner restaurant. And I would go there by myself and it'd be so odd. Like, why is a woman <laughs> eating by herself? You know, men can do that, but not women. And I think over the course of a lot of my working life, um, because when I worked as a journalist, the Rafu Shinpo, um, very early on, it now it's, I think, maybe, well, now I think it's 50-50. At times, it's been predominantly women, just because of the pay and other things. But I was um, like the only woman. And I would just have to go into a lot of male spaces. And I I found that not intimidating. In a way, I found it kind of freeing because I did not want to be limited to, you know, just a house or whatever. I wanted, I wanted to be the woman in the city, kind of like, like the name of Sylvia's class. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, I wanted it to be a realist. I mean, I personally don't, um, gravitate towards kick-ass uh, female protagonists. I know that's very popular, um, but it's just, I mean, the reality is if a woman is trying to figure out a crime, um, she has to depend on other things besides physical strength. Um, and also just the expectations, right? Like you're not supposed to be out in the world looking looking into things that, you know, so that's what a Aki's um, up against. And I probably um, made her more of a loner. Like she never had um, strong girlfriends growing up and probably that helped kind of establish that she's kind of odd. She's different because maybe a lot of Nisei of her age would have more of those girlfriends that maybe would control you know, say, don't go there, don't do this. People are still telling her that, you know, men, um, her peers and her parents. But um, but because she is at kind of unusual, and that's why it's a breach birth that's in the beginning, you know, no one thinks that she's unusual, but she is very unusual. So she goes and does things that other people do. So, yeah, I mean, and, and on her second point, um, yeah, my my editor and I talked about, and I know my agent is in the room, and uh, we were one. My my editor was wondering because most mysteries start off with a dead body, so like, and I don't. I was starting with the protagonist's birth, you know, and then we're traveling through, like the Ise Nise agricultural or you know, related to farming, produce market history. And then I'm going to Manzanar and then this, you know, the crime happens in Chicago, but actually with this book, I think it's, there's a metaphorical crime that's really happening, you know, all throughout. So it's not your typical mystery. And so, you know, I try to write it. So my editor suggested that I started in Chicago or them on the train to go to Chicago. It was actually my agent, Su Susie Cohen says, Naomi, don't do that. She, she personally doesn't like um, <laughs> books that start on trains, but, but also because um, she goes, we need to see the family before all of these things happen, which is totally true. So it, yeah, it's, and some of it is probably just my limitations um, because I am an outsider to Chicago, perhaps, if I was from Chicago, you know, and felt more confidence um, about writing about the city, who knows, maybe I would want to, you know, have more kind of um, Chicago based investigators, but, but
but just because of my own limited knowledge, that's the that's the way the book came together. So I have, I have a segue to a question um, asked from the chat from an English major, therefore asking a, a literary question. So the older sister character of Rose uh, seems to operate as the center uh, or hub of the family, uh, just as the center or the station of Clark and Division functions as a kind of center of a city or neighborhood. And uh, were you thinking about this as a, a kind of intentional parallel that there's like something about Rose that's central that gives directions and that's why the, the key scene of uh, this happens very early on so I'm not spoiling anything the key scene of of Rose's uh, death in the train station organizes the geography or sense of, of place of, of the novel it sounds good <laughs> maybe it was you know what was very interesting um uh uh a professor interviewed me about Clark and Division. She um, viewed Rose as a femme fatale, which was really interesting because I, you know, she's like the shining star, but I think in that, because we don't know much about her. I mean, we do, but we don't, you know, and there's, there's times where her political allegiances, like regarding the JCL, it's kind of, you know, you're trying to figure out, was she doing, was she informing? Was she doing something wrong? So there's, there's parts of her that's a question mark. Yeah. But so, I, yeah. But uh, I will say this in general for mysteries. I mean, I hate to say it, especially because the dead body here is a woman, but you know, the dead body is crucial in a mystery. I mean, I think in all mysteries, it is the organizing principle and it is grounding and it is helpful, I think, for the reader to kind of enter into that story with, with the presence of the dead body. Um, so uh, this is a good segue. You briefly mentioned the, the JACL. Um, with Japanese American Citizens League uh, had conferences in Chicago. Um, and an element of the, of the novel is to raise some of the controversial aspects of the Japanese American C Citizens League during um, the uh, wartime incarceration period. So that JACL was predominantly a Nisei or second generation organization. It's built into the name that they were citizens, uh, that um, there were accusations that the JACL uh, was actively cultivating informants and um, informing on other elements of the Japanese population as disloyal and also trying to solicit um, signing of membership cards that would indicate uh, that, you know, and pledge that you were a loyal citizen of, of the United States. So part of Rose's affiliation or potential affiliation with the JACL is to raise these questions. Well, maybe somebody in the community thought that she was a traitor or an Inu or an a dog or an informant. And that that's kind of hovering in the background there too. So with that context in mind, um, Karen Ishizuka asks, uh, in the novel, you write that the JCL recruited Nisei on street corners and that their membership application had to be notarized. Um, uh, Karen is saying that she's not heard of this before. Is there a possibility to elaborate? Um, are any of these applications or forms still extant? Have you seen them? Where would they be found? You no, know, I'm trying to think of where um, I know. Okay, one thing was there was a lot of recruitment on Terminal Island. So I think um, I think I got that information from one out of maybe three different places. I can't remember um, precisely right now, but I know that there was um, signage uh, on Terminal Island of saying that there would be this event and everyone's encouraged to come and that kind of thing. I think I might've seen, for some reason, I think a lot of this activity took place in the San Pedro area because um, I, I believe I had uh, read of other, you know, like a sign. I think it was maybe organized around not quite a convention, but that type of thing. And um, yeah, and I had not heard about the notarized either. So I know that I didn't manufacture that, that came out of somewhere. But Karen, I'm going to have to, if you really want the 
the precise details, I'm going to have to look at my notes and, and, and get you that. But, um, and I know I read uh, uh, some things came from the Pacific Citizen as well as um, Mike Masaoka's book as well. So um, yeah, so those are some of the sources that I looked at. So to fill in a little bit, the Pacific Citizen was a, a newsletter newspaper published by the Japanese American Citizens League. Terminal Island and San Pedro for folks who are not from the Los Angeles area are areas near the port of Los Angeles and some of the most, the zones deemed most sensitive by exclusion orders. So some of the earliest uh, exclu civilian exclusion orders were issued for Terminal Island and, and San Pedro because of their proximity to naval bases. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, I, I wanna ask a, a kind of follow-up question here too, which maybe circles back to that first question and about um, questions of loyalty and who you trust. So um, a, a key element of this novel is that um, Aki comes from a, a period of extreme dislocation, relocation, and justifiable suspicion of authority, be it the wartime relocation authority, uh, local police, uh, community institutions. Uh, Aki is in a new place, doesn't know who to trust. And I'm, I'm curious how you set about building the world of um, the beauty box or coworkers at the Newberry Library, like alternate uh, community institutions, uh, mutual aid societies, and mm. what they do in a crime novel where all the usual suspects for solving crimes and helping the protagonist are like really, <laughs> really maybe not the way to go. Like the Chicago Police Department during a period of, of massive corruption, uh, the war relocation authority in a time when there's still a lot of doubts about who's telling on who, what's going on with the Department of Justice and informing. Like, how did you set about building a world in which um, Aki can pursue justice where the standard or recognized ways of, of pursuing that aren't, aren't possible? I, I think um, it was helpful like that there were institutions like the Mutual Aid Society I mean, and it was also tied to a play. I mean, I think without the um, Montrose Cemetery, because they had such a close relationship. So definitely it was interesting places, was like a beauty parlor. And, and actually hair is a big theme throughout the book. And also something I was always, um, fascinated by, I know it's again, the WRA photos, but still those women had beautiful hair, you know, and I was like, how could they keep, and, you know, even in camp, they would have um, beauty parlors, right? So um, just, and, you know, I think the barbershop or the beauty parlor for so, so many cultures, you know, is, that's like the prime meeting place and where um, information is exchanged, you know, both for men and women, right? And so I like the feeling when I read um, that oral history on Kay in the beauty box and how she was, um, you know, doing the hair of the cross-dressing entertainers, you know, in the neighborhood. And she's like open, her heart was open to wh whoever came through the doors. And I go, I, I think some of it's like, things that are curious and against expectation. And I was going, I didn't expect that. I didn't think about that. But you know, those, that's her uh, customer base now, you know? So I think some of it is when I'm reading things like, oh, that's unexpected or else uh, a marker in the, I mean, you know, like that mausoleum, it's there's something that's still there. And I tried to pick places that people can still go to. I mean, it's hard in Chicago, but certain locations, you know, and other things that I would keep seeing like in different, um, it, it may not exist, exist anymore, like that tingling um, ice cream shop. I think a lot of Nisei went there and ate ice cream and it's like, okay, you know, it's a cute name. So sometimes it's just like the sound of a name that's mm. so fascinating to me that I kind of, grab hold of. Um, but yeah, it's all, all places where there's relationships, because that's what 
Aki. Oh, and then, you know, the Curtis, um, the, the candy factory, which had hired so many people. I mean, I just found it that, you know, it's also things that clash because you think of candy and chocolate and, you know, and then it's made in this industrial city, you know, like it's dirty and all these kind of things. So it's against expectation and so many, and it, but it had helped. I mean, it was a place too that like someone like Roy, he hits the glass ceiling. So he's very frustrated. But on the other hand, this candy company hired and helped a lot of people and there was an outside farm. So I like these places that are more nuanced. You know, there's good and bad, you know, um, and I think those kind of places are of interest. So, yeah, I think I'm looking at the Aragon, you know, places where people um, gathered and, you know, maybe it was like mono ethnic. So, um, Aki's able to get information out of people that the police or whatever other, you know, mainstream male investigators cannot get, you know, and I did that with the Masarai books too. And with both, you know, Aki was hard for me because she uh, is more of a like middle, higher middle class, you know, person. that's why the JCL was woven into that because it would make more sense with a, a, you know, an established family like that. So, um, because I'm more like, you know, a blue collar family, you know, we weren't poor, but more working class. So that's, you know, reflected in a lot of my Moss books. So, you know, being, you know, I, 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 I upped myself in class, <laughs> which took imagination as well. So this is a, a good segue to imagining yourself in the emotional states and feelings of the, the Nisei protagonist um, that, that Mary Doy is asking. So um, activist Yonsei or fourth generation folks often view the long-term psychological impact of their camp experience as something that echoes in their lives using the concept of intergenerational trauma. Um, it, Mary is saying that as a sansei, uh, that, that she can do oral histories uh, about resettlement, but it's difficult to turn the focus onto oneself and plumb one's own feelings. So how do you open yourself to imagine those? And, and I kind of like the image of the cigar box of recognizing what's in there to be opened up um, and, and, and thinking about that as one exercise for thinking about um, feelings and emotions. But uh, I'd, I'd love to hear, and I'm sure Mary would as well, what, what your process for thinking about uh, opening up those feelings and emotions is well, like. I think um, it is uh, one advantage of the crime novel because something really horrific happens. I mean, something already horrific, the incarceration and all that has happened. But here's like finally freedom and then a loved person is found dead, you know, and anybody, any, you know, all people can relate to that kind of loss and sadness and especially Rose who had, you know, she's in the position where people really depended on her to neg negotiate the outside world for them. So, um, yeah, so I think, in a sad way, you know, what we writers, especially mystery writers do, is we put our protagonists in the, in the grinder, you know, so they're really under intense pressure. So I think under that intensity, it, that kind of emotion can't help but come out. But I, I do have to admit the scenes where the whole family, you know, it's just mourning. And sometimes uh, that grief, did not manifest itself until later. And, and that's what I found, like even my own family's um, trauma, you know, about being atomic bomb survivors, I could see that it comes out in really weird ways, you know? And um, I, I think some people at, who hadn't finished the book, you know, yet who were in the middle of the book and they were wondering about the mother's response, that it seemed so cold, you know? And um, but later, you know, there's some incident that's totally unrelated to her daughter's death that just 
you know, makes her crumble because she's just compartmentalizing and holding strong because that's what she's had to do. I mean, she's essentially a picture bride. I mean, and my mother was married through Omiyai. So that kind of experience, I totally understand. It's a type of arranged marriage. So she, she came to this country without knowing anybody. And just even if you had the best husband, to be in that kind of situation, you know, is it's I, I can't even imagine. And I, I'm sure some women lost their minds. I'm sure some women maybe committed suicide. I know some women ran off, but I think most women um, just try to make the best of the situation, you know, and focus on their children. And, you know, just like, you know, um, Mrs. Ito's just looking at the list, you know, what can I check off? You know, I, I did this. It's more performance based, right? I did this and this, and this is how I could, how I lead my life. And um, yeah, so I think, I mean, it's really, I do, I have to say this regarding this story, probably because I'm an outs I am an outsider to the incarceration experience because it didn't happen to my family. Uh, my parents, you know, it happened to my dad's cousins and uncle and and uncles. But um, yeah, but I think somehow the, you know, the Hiroshima trauma, like, you know, I can understand how that's passed on. And in that way, I think I could empathize and also just doing so many um, oral histories um, and interviews and just working in the community and also um, getting in conflict with people. I think community members, I think, because a lot of times, I don't know, I've had a lot of people threaten me <laughs> when I was like a 28 year old editor, you know, because they were mad about something that appeared in the paper. But I think that position too was helpful because I began to understand what triggered, triggered people. And, um, and some of it was my own naive, again, the naivete, you know, the outsider comes in. And because one of my first, um, I think we started, when I started at, as editor, uh, readers and reparations, the payments were just starting to come in. And I was like, so dumb. I go, okay, readers, tell us what you're going to do with their $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to understand, Andrew, this is 1990s and I'm, I'm 28 years old, right? And oh my gosh, I got so blasted, you know, and rightfully so. But it's just like, um, you know, so I think over time, like working in the community, you know, I, my sensitivity has increased and culturally I understand. But one thing... Um, I, I think it is tragic for the for because so many things were unsaid, you know, just because people couldn't, you know, they couldn't say what they had gone through. They were, they're like Mrs. Ito, you know, they're just trying to make a better life, you know. And then I think you get used to not saying, right? You just get used to not saying anything. And um and and Ironically, for me as a reporter and oral historian, sometimes people would tell me things that they had never told their children or grandchildren. And I think because I was a safe person. And I will say this, that might even be true, you know, for my own family, because you, you, sometimes you don't want to say certain things to your own children or grandchildren because they're part of this, you know, and and there's all these concerns, like, who are you going to hurt? Are you invading the privacy of a, another person? You know, it's all this relational stuff. But when an outsider comes in, it's like, you know, she's like a blank. Who is, you know, if there's some modicum of trust, you know, um, they'll be more, more forthcoming. And I think, um, I think that's one of the advantages of like being a reporter for ethnic paper rather than even a mainstream paper, because um, you get to be part of the family. I mean, in the sense that they're familiar with your name and they kind of know like this person can't be making a lot of money. <laughs> so she's probably, you know, uh, committed to telling, you know, like, 
telling, I'm covering the um, ballroom dancing, you know, competition. And, you know, every little story is something we're going to cover. So I think there's some kind of trust there. Um, yeah, but I, uh, I have seen Yonsei um, people like respond to this book that because they've always kind of imagined what was it like for their, you know, elder in like Chicago. And who knows, you know, again, this is, it's based on my research, but it's still fictional. But I think it just opens maybe the emotional possibilities of what was going on with their, yeah. with their ancestor. Okay, so, so unfortunate that we're running out on time on a conversation that, that could go on for, for hours, I think. Um, and uh, I'd like to strongly encourage folks to, to pick up the book if they haven't already. There's information in the chat about that. And to reinforce this message, uh, let's turn things back to Janie. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm really sad we're, there's so much to talk about, but we're unfortunately limited by just one hour of the day. Thank you so much, uh, Naomi and Andrew, for um, giving insight into your writing process and into the characters of the book. Um, it was all really interesting and I learned a lot and I hope um, everyone else did as well. So um, if you want to um, purchase a copy of Clark and Division, it is available at Eastern Books of Berkeley. You can order it online um, or pop by in store. We are in downtown Berkeley. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I included a link in the chat um, just to ask for any feedback for the event, what we did well, what other events would you like to see? Um, your feedback is greatly appreciated. And lastly, before we wrap up, um, if you enjoyed this event, uh, please re feel free to check out um, our upcoming events at Eastwind. So we have one coming up in three days about contemporary Asian American activism with a really great panelist, as well as um, in March, we have a book talk with the authors of a newly released um, book about the Black Panther Party for young adult readers. So yeah, that is it for me. Thank you everyone for